Welcome to Proper Football, guys. Thank you for joining us today. Our guest is Jimmy Conrad, or Jimmy Conrad Dino, as he <laughs> likes to say, as I've just found out. So, center back or not in the world of football, any name goes, anything in football goes. Jimmy, it is an honor, a pleasure to have you on the show. Dude, I, I love the content you're throwing out, the background that you have going in your studio, office, <laughs> apartment, wherever that is. Uh, is just, spe- you know, you almost want to say, you got to give us a tour. Eventually, there's going to need to be a tour of every little item that's on there. Uh, thank you for joining us today on Proper Football. Uh, Paul, it's an absolute honor to be invited to this podcast. I'm excited about what you guys are doing. And so it's a big thrill to be on here. And I'm curious as to what you have in store for me. Yeah, well, so then <laughs> let's jump right into it, right? So first of all, for those that don't know uh, and the show's format, what we want to do is get to know uh, the person that we're talking to, he or she. Uh, the idea of proper football and football in general is, for me, the real turn on is the culture. I mean, obviously, the 90 minutes are super exciting, uh, mm-hmm. you know, all the training leading up to. But for me, the 24 hours a day, that is the pubs, the food, the conversation, the fashion, the art, everything that sort of works us up until that match uh, is really what the turn on is. Uh, you played for the U.S. men's national team, 205. To, that's, that's a that's a big national. That's a big time on a national level. Um and uh, obviously, there's a lot of MLS time. Your major, the major times with uh, Kansas City. Um, so we're going to get into a little bit of MLS. Mm-hmm. But two questions. One of the things we'd like to do here is ask the audience what they might want to get an answer from you directly. <laughs> and I know today, you know, dude, everybody can just tweet. You get right to it. You get an answer. But my favorite question out of the ones that I've chosen, I've only chosen two. Um, Tell us the story or where the plastic yank <laughs> came from. I th- I have a guess, um, but I think only you can explain to us, please. So the what is where does that come from? Sure, sure. So I, I have a Twitch channel. I have signed a one year deal with Twitch. I'm a partner channel with them, and I only stream sports. Twitch is known as a video game platform, but they're trying to take forays into other areas. Uh, of culture, ultimately, right? So not only, like you guys do, do I talk about the 90 minutes and I have watch parties, but we also have other shows where we just talk about what's going on around the game that doesn't always involve transfers, even those are those are fun and, and other <laughs> things. But yeah. we get into some of the nitty gritty. We talk about some hard subjects and, and the racism and sexism and all that type of stuff. Some of it's heavy, some of it's light, but we're not afraid to talk about all of it. And during a watch party recently, I had... Somebody, you know, anonymous, of course, because nobody wants to have or has nobody wants to. Yeah. <laughs> and they don't have the courage to put their real name behind things, but comes in and says, Oh, you're just a plastic yank. I bet you've never even been to a game before. Yeah. And and my whole my whole community is like, whoa, whoa, whoa tap the brakes, you know? Yeah. And so I have these clips that I roll my goal against Mexico, my calling cards, right? My tackle against the seven-time yeah. ballon d'Or winner Messi at the Copa America. And my tackle against Drogba in an all-star Do you game use that at Chelsea. cocktail parties? That's my oh, real 100%. Like, Can you drop that like, hey, nice to meet you. By the way, you pull out your phone. This, you know, like. Yeah, right, right. So this is what I've done. What have you done with your life? You know, <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's, 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 if anything, yeah. it's, I, I, I take it for what it is. I, I know exactly how good I was as a player. I'm not going to try to pretend to be anything but, but I will roll those highlights all the time just for fun. But I also have a famous miss that I had. Well, it's not famous, thankfully, but it was in the 2005 Gold Cup final where I missed from like a foot out. I popped it over the bar. It was very uh, Harry Maguire in the Europa League not too long ago where you're just like, how did he miss that? You know what? I would have been like Timo Werner, pre-Timo Werner, but I was a center back. So I guess you kind of expect me to have those kinds of misses. So I'll show my failures as well, but uh, we have fun with it, of course. And and I started to roll these clips and, and and this guy disappeared. This was live on Twitch while on you're Twitch. while this yeah. while you got that comment. You and the you and your fan base decided, wait a second, let's fucking explain exactly who this plastic yank really is, sort of thing. Right. Exactly, and you, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And so he just walked into the wrong room. Now I'm sure there's other Twitch streamers out there that are doing watch parties that have never played and and have probably never been to the city of the team they support and all that type of stuff. But I'm not the guy you should become you poking the bear at that point. Yeah. Now, I, I preach inclusivity. I, I have time for everybody. <laughs> if you're going to come in and give me some shit, then you have to be willing to take it in return. But yeah. but I, I'm not, not going to ban you. I'm not going to tell you you need to leave. No. I'm going to try to kill you with kindness. 
So, I'm going to say that I think your opinion is valued because everybody has different perspectives on the game. The game's for everybody. And who am I to all of a sudden be the, the police cop on who can support the game and who can love the game and who can't? And, right? and who so, can make comments and who can't? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Right. So so now there is a line, of course, if you're going to be disrespectful consistently yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and not. I, all I'm asking is for people to meet me halfway. It's fair. You can take shots at me. And, and people say, oh, well, you only played for America in the World Cup. Oh, Dude, what? Awesome, huh? <laughs> I, uh, do you think do you think that's e you just think that's easy because I played here in the state? We have our own struggles. We have our own system that I'm sure a lot of people think holds pe players yeah. back, right? And you have all these types of things. And to just that casual dismissal is so incredibly intense for like what are you even saying? Yeah, but that 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 dismissal, and unfortunately or fortunately, you're so goddamn good at this that. I have like a system of like, how are we going to get to know Jimmy or the cat? Who am I talking to? You're just fucking throwing out all this gem. Like, I don't even, I just want to damn with me at this point. Like I'm almost throwing this shit out the window, but the question, but what you're saying is actually just as important to the way people look at the MLS, which is something we have to get into mm -hmm. and sort of, again, that dismissal that, Oh, that's a North American league. Oh, when it originally forget the early, you know, the seventies and the 80s, like forget all that. I'm talking about like 25 years of MLS and how it was, you know, it's considered sort of, or it had been, or still has a bit of that mm -hmm. misnomer that it's the retirement league, you know, the pros come to make their last dollars, that kind of stuff. You played for your country at a world cup. The, hear which, what I'm which, saying. which I'll jump in and say, if I only yeah. had MLS experience and played in a world cup, I must, I must have sucked in that World Cup then, right? Because MLS sucks. And, and, and in fact, it's the opposite. In the World yeah. Cup that I played in, me and Clint Dempsey were the two highest rated players on our team. We got knocked out of the group stages, but we were the two yeah. highest rated players when everybody came home and we played all yeah. the games. And we only had MLS experience at that point. And what I learned throughout that process, Paul, is that you're either ready when the whistle blows or yeah. you're not. It doesn't matter what you did before. It doesn't matter where you're going to play after. Did you show up when the whistle blowed and everybody was watching? And did everything mattered change, at that moment. Things, and I did, and so did Clint. And and other players just didn't perform as well as they were expected. A lot of them had European experience. And so it just, when people come in and, again, go back to the casual discussion. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's just like, ah, like, you don't understand what you're saying. You don't understand what you're saying. It's just it's just an easy thing for you to say. And it, and it actually takes not as much as it used to, because I used to even be more triggered by it. But now mm -hmm. I'm just, these people just don't know what they're saying. They don't understand that the, 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 the implications of their words. And now I have a, lo a lot more patience for it. In some yeah, but you ways. also have a tough skin, dude. You don't give me this. You're a, you're a pro, you're an ex pro athlete that must've heard some dirty shit. Uh, you know, <laughs> yes. No, but let's be honest. No, hold on. Let's be honest. Let's be honest. <laughs> let's be actually honest. Plastic yank is nothing compared to what I, I assume you could have heard or heard from other players, teammates. Game. I mean, let's be honest. Mm -hmm. Then you're on social media. You're in the public eye. And again, please, you're going to have to give a little bit of your backstory about being a professional sure. uh, professional footballer than moving into the world you are now. Because I would say that more of this generation and generations to come will know you as a, a, a content creator, a person. Mm -hmm. I'm being honest, dude. Like, yep. they'll check you out. They'll say, oh, okay, here's his pedigree. He can yap about this, but we know him as, as this, right? Mm -hmm. So plastic yank, dude, is nothing. Like that. No, it's at, nothing. At this no. point, yeah, it's a joke. And anyways becomes almost a badge of honor and you get great like you know like great stories out of mm -hmm. out of this twit that did you know who was really just spitting venom in the sense where any time a north american talks about football that's not from europe it's always the exact same type of person that sends out the what would you know you're not from let's call it london mm -hmm. what the fuck are you talking about dude Football didn't even, you know, like right, right. the story of football and, and like the big picture of what it means and what it encompasses. So I love it. Like personally, I love the story, right? It's, it's, I'll just say that they're trying to hurt my feelings. And, and to your point, I do have very thick skin. I, I've been told I wasn't good enough. I don't know how long I had a college yeah. coach say, you're not, you're not going to be a pro. You're not good enough. And, mm -hmm. and I, I learned quite early on and I had this opportunity to, when I was 15 or 16, I got to ask a question of Marcelo Balboa's dad, okay, mm -hmm. who was a like a local youth coach in the Southern California area where I grew up. Now, Marcelo Balboa at that point had played in two World Cups. So 
I got to ask him a question. He came over and talked to our team and I'm like, hey, yeah, I give the old generic question. How did Marcelo Balboa play in two World Cups, Mr. Balboa, you know? Yeah. And, and and knowing me, if, if you ask me that question, well, I'm going to give you like a 25 minute rundown of how to how make it all work. And all he said was he went to the park and worked on his game every day for two hours. And then he moved on to the next question. And I thought at that moment, it hit me like a ton of bricks. Holy, it's it's up to me to decide how good I'm going to be at anything. And and that was such a pivotal moment in my life. And I went out there and I tried to do that. Dude, the hardest thing is actually facing up to how good you are at anything. And that forced me. When I went outside, I'm like, oh, cool. I'm going to do what Marcelo Balboa did. Let's go. Two hours. <laughs> yeah, I can do that. Right, sure. right? And so you go out there and I'm at the park. Or so I'm at the little uh, little elementary school by my house. There's a wall I can play up against. Yeah. I have no idea, Paul, what I what I'm what am I supposed to work? Okay, I'm here. Now what? Now what? Yeah, yeah right. and so you're out there and I'm thinking, okay, cool. Uh well, let's just try some juggling. I know my left foot's not great, but let's just see it. <laughs> I am so bad with my left foot. I'm embarrassed. Now imagine being embarrassed and there's nobody there. Like there's it's not like I'm I'm there's no peer pressure. I'm not being embarrassed because somebody's watching me. I'm just embarrassed because I have to accept the fact that I'm not as good as I thought I was. Right. And that is a hard acceptance to make. So after it, 10 minutes, after 10 minutes into this two hour day foray that I decided I was going to do, I went home with my tail between my legs because it's a lot easier to play, go play video games with my friends than it is to actually go out there and do something to try to get better at whatever particular skill that you're trying to do. Now, to my credit, I went back out there again and I had a little bit of an idea of what I'm walking into. Okay. I have to acknowledge that I'm not good with my left foot. What am I going to do about it? And so I put an X on the wall. Okay, I'm just going to try to hit this X on the wall with one bounce off the ground because it's a black top and just try to go left foot inside of the foot. It'll just start there. Again, I was so bad. I left after 10 minutes, but I kept urging myself to go out there. And what happened was the catalyst was my, my other, the U team I was on, I started to get a little bit better than those guys and I could feel it. Because I was getting more comfortable when the ball came my way. I wasn't as panicked. I Quick, wasn't as pass anxious. It off, you I actually would hold on. Yeah. I, could, I could relax because I knew where the ball was going to go. I knew how I wanted to play. My technique was getting smoother. And all of a sudden, once you start to catch that fire, you're off to the races. I'm like, wait, wait a second. What if I turn that 10 minutes into 20 minutes? I bet you I'd be twice as good. Yeah. And then you start to apply that. And then it would be, it got to a point where I was out to school for an hour and a half. My mom would be looking for me to see where it was because it was dark. She's like, what's wrong with you? And then I turned to like, what if I started running more? What if I started lifting weights? And you start huh. to add all these elements and then brick by brick, all of a sudden, but the coaching, better and better the and better. coaching in your life didn't sort of push that a lot that sort of thematic and thinking along yeah it did and did so, your parents did your parents have an influence on you come in 10 minutes after you're like yo mom i'm out i'm gonna go practice for two hours i'll see you maybe after for dinner you're back 10 minutes later 20 minutes later she's like or mom and dad are like you know what's up did they have a sort of uh, an influence on giving you that that mindset to be like you got this don't give yourself a hard time go back at it tomorrow that's, that's a great question. My, my parents had me when they were 18 years old and they broke up before I was born. So I was a bit of a unique situation, paycheck to paycheck. My mom, I was a latchkey kid. So my mom didn't get home till like 5.30 uh, after a long day of work where she's just trying to put food on the table. And, and my dad was around, awesome guy. Everybody was really supportive, but they didn't know the game. So they didn't try to pretend to insert any type of Where knowledge. Where did football or... come from in your life? So, so good question. My grandfather, my dad's from, my dad's Danish. So my grandfather was from Denmark and he kicked the ball around with me uh, when I was about four or five and kind of started that that process and, and just that enjoyment. And maybe there's some attachment to wanting to make my grandfather proud or whatever it is. He died when I was 11. So I only had about five or six years of his influence. But the seed was was planted. And, and when I was playing locally, I was pretty good because I just had touched the ball a lot more than the other kids. So my comfort level was a little bit uh, higher than some of the other kids. And athletically, I was always pretty good. At some point though, uh, I started to play a lot of baseball and, and my dad was more into the baseball scene. He liked that because he played it himself. So I think he understood the game a little bit more than, than, than soccer. And I got forced at 11. Yeah, but it's also I, the seventies in California, dude. It's, ba it's baseball. It's not, it's not football. It's not soccer. Right, 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 right. Yeah, no, no. And, and so when I was 11, my grandfather died, I was, it was 1988. And, uh, 
at that point, soccer started to, there's more people playing for sure and more organized leagues, right? So there was places to play. And, and I was doing so well with this little AYSO all-star team, Region 98, let's go. Woo! And uh, <laughs> we were really good. And so the, 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 the dad there had a son who was playing in college at Northridge. And he would come and train us sometimes. And it got to the point where he needed a little extra scratch. He said he would coach us. And, but we needed to get out of the, the rec stuff and get into club. And he basically propositioned all the parents and the kids, like, you need to only focus on one sport at this point. You can't, you can't be all around. Like, if you really want to get good at this and you want this team to go somewhere, we all have to be kind of dedicated to the same purpose and have the same goal. And so my parents were pissed. Like, how are you going to ask an 11-year-old to make a choice on their future yeah, it's to that level? And I was like, baseball's boring as shit, dad. You know, like I'm going to play soccer because I can move around. There's more creativity to the sport. Uh, there's more thought, you know, that there's just, there's something about being a little bit part. I, baseball feels very individualistic in a collective sense, right? It's just kind of, mm -hmm. you're at, you know, I don't know. There, there's obviously some camaraderie there. there, there yeah, of course. But, of but course. it's a different, different feel. And, and. There's a lot more influence, I think, from the manager and the coach always telling you, you know, what pitch do you want to pitch and all that. I mean, it's yeah. just like you never really get to think for yourself. And, and I felt like with soccer, there was parameters that the coach could set. But then within those parameters, you could be yourself. You could express yourself in a way that you couldn't in some of these other sports. I'm really uh, drawn to basketball as well for the same reasons, because I think that there's a lot of creativity there, even though it is very heavily coached. And so so it was a pretty easy decision for me. I didn't think anything of it. And that really set me on my course. And that coach was very pivotal for me in my development as well. Because and to get back to the point earlier, when you say, well, weren't coaches involved? Now that I coach, when you're around a kid that you can see, listens to everything you say, eats it, it, and tries to apply, and is very coachable. And, and, yeah. and you can see it. Every time they come out, they're asking you questions about how they can get. I was that kid. Yeah. And, and it didn't really start to hit me until after I talked to uh, Marcelo Balboa's dad, Louis of how to kind of connect all those pieces together. But I was always pretty coachable and I always wanted to get better at this. And I never felt comfortable. I never wanted to feel comfortable. I wanted to keep pushing and see how far I could take things. And when really did you crystallize? When did you know that this was during that point, your, during this, your, your thought process during your, I'm falling in love with the game. I'm starting to understand my body. I'm understanding football i'm understanding i'm becoming a little bit better than some of my teammates um and i don't mean that in a disrespectful way but obviously mm -hmm. you know there, there there tends to be a moment just like you said i had more a little more control with the ball because i started earlier you know that kind of stuff mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. when did you start to understand this was going to be my career meaning or maybe the question i should rephrase it as when did you decide i'm all in that's it I'm going at it through universe. I'm going at it no matter what it takes. I just want to play football. I love everything else that, like you said, I like basketball. I like educate, like all the things that you like. But my main train, my main sort of, you know, station is going to be within football. When did that hit you? And then you understood there was no, no room to mess around. Do you know what I'm talking about? Like, <laughs> yeah, that's no, a great question. It's interesting because there was no professional league when I was a kid. Correct. So the NWSA. The N N A N A S L folded in '83, if I'm not mistaken. So I'm six at that point, and MLS didn't start till '96. So those are pretty formative years for me, where the only thing I could really strive for was going to a good college. And I grew up about 45 minutes away from UCLA, and I would go watch them play. I would see Kobe Jones, Joe Max Moore, Brad Friedel, like big, big names that ended That's up being cool. very influential cool. in U.S. soccer, playing for UCLA. Head coach Ziggy Schmidt. And I would sit there and be like, wow, I wonder what it would be like to play for UCLA. That was, that UCLA, was really UCLA Was ambition. UCLA at the time the, the number one university pumping out the hits? What I'm talking about, you know what I'm talking about, like that, 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 uh, uh, that sort of North Carolina basketball time framing, mm -hmm. that Notre Dame football time framing, you know, that was it one of those, that was the time that UCLA just had. There was some sort of magic going on. Everything was in place, and it was just pumping out the 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 professional athletes. I mean, dude, you took a drive to watch university level sort of. Yeah, football. but that was all you could see live. Ultimately, I, you had. I know, but how important is? But think about that. That's like it's huge. It, it is. It is important. I, I when I speak to kids now, there's a lot of them that like to play but don't actually go watch the game. And and there's something really valuable about watching the game live because you can see a lot of the off the ball stuff that you lose when you're watching on TV and, and how, how 
the, the subtleties and nuances of the game of how they create space. How do they how do they support a player on the ball? How do they how do they pull away from a defender to, to make the game easier for themselves? So those are all really important things to take note of or things that you just pick up on kind of passively when you're watching the game. Because you're like, oh, that's how Kobe Jones receives the ball when he's got his back to goal and he's under pressure. You know, that, that type of yeah. stuff is really important. And, and so for me to kind of visualize what it would be like to play there, and you have to go live it and you got to taste it. And so it was important for me to go see a live game. And I encourage all the young players that are listening or parents of young players to, to make sure that they have that opportunity as well because it can give them that belief that at least I can do it too. If I just do a few more things or if I can see how they're playing, I can do it too. And that's a really important evolution, I'd say, of a player. It, it's it, what was interesting is when I think about UCLA and, and just in terms of overall ambition, I didn't think about Europe. You know, there was no, we didn't have the 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 access to to watching games. Correct. And Grant didn't have the access. To, there's no yeah. internet. I don't know what the hell is going on in the transfer window. I I don't know. I, I don't know what's going on. I had I, I subscribed to Soccer America. My grandma got it for me as a Christmas gift. So I got to read a, a, basically about the U.S. men's national team. So I learned a lot yeah. about Eric Winalda and Balboa and all these guys. Now, I wanted to say quickly about UCLA. Yeah. When I played in the World Cup in 06, yeah. at that point, more UCLA players had played for the national team, men's national team, than any other university in the country. Well, that's that's my point. And, that's huge. And so, so to get to your point, yeah, I wanted to kind of crystallize that point and, and, and validate that because... It, it, at that point, it was pumping out a lot of players, and and uh, I'm an on, it's honored to be a part of that process. Now, I will say very quickly, I played in the high school all star game, and the coach didn't really know much about me, but I was just really solid playing against some of the best players in Southern California who were being recruited to universities all over the country, and he just couldn't believe why I wasn't being recruited because I was just holding my own, doing my thing. And I think if you look back on my career, I was very good at doing that no matter what the level. I could just hold my own no matter what the level and adapt accordingly. And and he just honestly was so taken aback. He called UCLA on my behalf like, hey, I got a kid here that I think flew under the radar and I think you should look at him. Hmm. Now, I had good SAT scores. I had a 3.8 GPA. I skipped a grade when I was younger. I was like Doogie Hauser there for a little while when I was like eight. And, hmm. and, 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 even that, having all that behind me, I still couldn't, I didn't get accepted into the school. They sent me a letter. I wish I would have kept it saying, had you been accepted, we would have let you try out, but we're going to have to pass on this right now. Wow. And so I didn't get in. And I was heartbroken. That was the school that I wanted to play yeah, yeah. And, and, and had ambitions and dreams about. So I went down, my, call, my, my club coach, who was still the coach that coached me when I was 11. He was that, that guy from Northridge. He called San Diego State, a lot of schools, but he called San Diego State on my behalf and said, hey, listen. This kid flew under the radar. They don't have much of a, a scouting budget. They can't go around. So they kind of have yeah. to take word of mouth. He really bought in. Chuck Clegg was the coach into, and he coached Balboa and Winalda at, at San Diego State back in the day. And he said, uh, all right, I'll give them books to come in. You know, just like, whatever. I'll just get them in and we go from there. And I'm like, yes, a Division One scholarship, you know, even though it was only like $300 a semester. But I was telling all my buddies I got a D1 scholarship. Yeah, yeah. And I took it. I took the opportunity. And sure. what I did right away was I made sure, and I learned this early on, that it's pretty rare for a coach to cut the fittest guy on the team. Because the fittest guy on the team gives a shit. And, and it, this, whatever this is, whatever the coach has presented to them, it matters. And they took it serious. So I knew going in that they ran this three miles under 19 minutes. That was kind of their fitness test to start. Right. And I got 17-10. And I Sweet. beat everybody by three quarters of a lap. I was, I was ready. Yeah, I, I was ready to go and <laughs> I was not fucking around yeah, yeah. and I wanted to make sure that everybody knew it. And this was before because you do all the fitness stuff before you even touch a ball. So yeah. you, so I wanted to make sure I had a good first impression right. that I, I'm here to compete. That actually to, has an influence this. anyways on the rest. Of course it does. Of course it does. And it sets the tone for how sure. you you want to be received and how you you're going to hold other yeah. people accountable. Because we had seen I honestly I saw this because they ran the freshman first. Because I don't think they wanted the, the the upperclassmen to be competing against these freshmen. And we had a lot of freshmen, mind you. But when I watched the older guys run, our captain ducked into the bleachers after five laps and waited to lap nine and then jumped back about? in. You, I'm not I'm not kidding about? you. Our captain, dude. Willie Where? Franklin. Willie Franklin. I'll never forget it. First he of all, you went 
captain of the team. Yeah, but I understand. But there's a, there's a whole the whole team, including everybody else, is there. Nobody sees this. He's our party animal, though. Like that that was his reputation. Okay, it was yeah, insane. So that, I'm like, what is happening? Did. So yeah, yeah. so anyway, I got my experience. Yeah, and, and my sophomore year is actually I played out wide and up top. I scored against Cal. I scored an over uh, a goal in overtime to beat Cal, which was sick. And and, and that was my only goal in my freshman. Or I think I scored two goals my freshman year. But I was actually playing the sixth spot in the CDM, and and my coach was so interesting. I think that's the best way to describe him. I played the six all preseason, killed it in preseason games, and then the first game of the season he starts me up top, and it just completely threw me off. I was a young player, sure. and yeah, it just threw me off, and and I didn't really recover from that. And it, what I found out was he didn't trust freshmen to play in the spine of the team, so he only put freshmen up top or out wide. Right and until like, you that's, until you that's felt you were weathered dude. enough. Yeah. yeah, it's crazy. It's so yeah, but that's back thinking. then. Coaching was yeah, completely, yeah, yeah. everything was different. And so I have a, I I know you haven't gotten to the, where from here you've gotten to the MLS, but I got to ask you this question on coaching because you're in coaching now, or you've been like, if yeah, you know what coaching. I mean by now, you're sorry. No, yeah, I am. I'm getting my coaching licenses, and I'm yeah, coaching. and well, yeah. and you've been around it, and you study, and you and I, I can you can tell this is something definitely a, a universe where you want to you're gonna want to get you're gonna <laughs> dig into, um. The youth that you're dealing with today, uh, EA Sports and FIFA and gaming, and bringing it back to the conversation of you have to watch it live to understand things off of the ball. Mm -hmm. Is gaming today um, an, a, an added bonus to a footballer? That's, I know that sounds like a crazy comment, but does that add to the understanding of the game or does it detract i mean i'm not saying you can just game and then go play i'm just saying if if the kid dude if you love playing fifa and you love playing fifa you're picking stuff up the same way when you're watching it live on t uh sorry live when you're watching it on tv and then when you're at the game each one of those elements gives you something else to take in right and then you hopefully package it together and then mm -hmm. bring it out with you on the pitch no, it's a great question. And I'll uh, raise my hand and say that I worked for EA Sports. I was a host of their global tournaments yep. for, for FIFA for four years. Yeah. Uh, I have a great relationship with them. That relationship's over. They they correctly, and I almost encouraged them to go find a younger mm -hmm. host. I feel like I was aging out of the What up, Gramps? I, yeah, yeah. I was pretty much the age of the of the people watching, or the dads, uh, the age of the parents of the, the people watching. So what? Well, no, whatever, no, whatever. Energy is good. Energy is good. Energy, and, and obviously, yeah. I bring a nice uh, pedigree to to what I'm saying. That said, I want to throw that out there because uh, some people are like, oh, he's just he's just uh, you know selling the Kool Aid. He's drinking, blah blah blah. No, I'm, I think it's on. a gateway drug. I think that FIFA is a gateway drug for casual fans in particular. You see yeah. a lot of NFL stars, NBA stars that play FIFA. Like that's their favorite game. Correct. It's a great introduction to the world of how the game is played. Oh, so wait, I got to finish top four. And that gets me into the Champions League. Like they, you start to get that understanding and you don't have to feel dumb by asking those questions because now the game has kind of answered those questions for you. Yeah. And so I think FIFA does a or lot of that work. you can ask those questions within the game. I Meaning you're playing exactly. your mate, you're playing your buddy. Oh, I can't, that's offside? Oh, shit. Right, 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 right. Yeah, but you've learned that's the game. It's not right. different in real world, right? Right. So all that, th those settings, like those, and I think that's what, that is kind of a roadblock for a lot of casual fans for any sport. You just don't know the subtleties and nuance and you never want to sound dumb and don't want to ask those kind of obvious questions because you want to be cool, man. I mean, everybody wants to be cool. So, and I think FIFA does a really good job of, oh, promotion relegation. That makes sense. I don't know why every league that in the world doesn't do that, including the NBA. That would be awesome. Uh, you know, and, and all these little things. And then from there, you start to just get exposed to more players. Right. Now, unfortunately, for the smaller leagues and or clubs, those teams don't get played a lot. So ultimately, it continues to perpetuate the world's best players and, and gives that that particular team some love. Now, for instance, I did a big career mode thing on my YouTube channel a long time ago, and and I was at Atletico Madrid, and I fell in love with Kevin Gamero just because he was sco scoring me a ton of goals in 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 career mode. And, <laughs> and now I follow Kevin Gamero's career like with a passion, a red hot passion. I love Kevin Gamero. Yeah. So. So and, and I never would have done that had I not played FIFA. And I think it gives you a little bit of Tell that. Tell me you reached out to him on socials and told him this. Dude, I've tried this and he just does not respond. He just so doesn't we're appreciate gonna clip that. We're gonna clip that and we're gonna push it everywhere. And there's gonna so. be a goddamn response. You hear me? 
I have I have a Kevin Camaro uh, jersey when he played at Atleti. Then of course he left, and I was sad. But uh, yeah, he's cute as a button. Respond. He's cute as a button, and he scores goals. <laughs> he scores big goals. He's so cute so as a button. He, so so it's uh it's it's a really good way to get introduced to the game and then from there you start to explore some of the intricacies and subtleties of of what else you can do as you start to get more familiar with players as you understand that oh Neymar's got five star skills i can i can use him in a way and he wouldn't have that if he didn't have it in real life right because you're probably right. balancing it off to other games or sports you might know with 2k or madden or whatever and yeah. and it all kind of starts to tie in together and i think it's it's a great way for people to get introduced to the game or continue to strengthen what they thought they knew and give them even more information as you know, because if you do career mode, if you do, you know, ultimate team or whatever it is, you have to know some other players to strengthen your team to compete against others. And so it gives yeah. a nice base of knowledge, I think, about all the players that are out there. And I think that's pretty cool. Uh, MLS, it would, it would be, it would be crazy. Now, again, I know I don't have you all day, so we'll make this, I, I know I can only <laughs> extract so much info, but based on your career, based on, um, where the league was, um, let's even just let's not go twenty. Let's let's say ten years ago, and right. and where we are today, and where we're going, um, you know, with the recruiting and the um, and all the clubs uh, building proper community engagement, building proper youth systems, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, MLS next, like, dude, it's crazy. If if, if people take a moment to digest where we're at in the MLS and North America football and where it's going. Cause we haven't reached where we're going yet. Um, what are your impressions on how things are going? And I, and I, and you know, you can't hurt anybody's feelings here, but you know, <laughs> no, but this is really important because you know where I'm going with this. I want to know, you know, how do you feel things have progressed over let's, let's say the last five, 10 years, for, you know, when you were there, but even more so like what do you, over the last three, four years, it's just been leaps and bounds, right? It um, has. What's happening with Mexico? What's happening with this interplay? Like, dude, you know, so what's your take, like your, your, um, your water cooler take on how things are going uh, in the MLS? Okay. Well, I'll just start from personal experience. My rookie year in MLS was in San Jose with the earthquakes. I made eight hundred dollars and fourteen cents every two weeks after taxes. Fucking we used enough. to have to drive thirty minutes from our locker room, from our locker room, which was a college stadium at San Jose State, down to Morgan Hill, which was thirty to forty-five minutes. We'd have to change there, and then drive all the way back if we wanted to take a shower. You usually, just drop your gear, or you had yeah. to go wash your own gear. So, so, and you go to you. Be, we go to youth fields. We were going to a, a, a complex that had fifteen fields, and we just got one of them. That was our training my rookie year. Now you fast forward to where we are 25 years later, and we have $100 million training facilities being built that have multiple surfaces. Oh, you're going to play on turf this upcoming game? Cool, we got a turf field. Oh, we're going to play on Kentucky bluegrass or whatever the hell? Yeah, we got that covered too. Oh, we got Bermuda grass. Cool, we're going to play on... It's like, what is even happening right now? I can't even... I don't even recognize MLS. And, and it's great. There's so many improvements that are happening. Now, for some people, that's not happening fast enough or or... And I get it, man. I, I like patience too. In some ways, I feel like sometimes the league is succeeding despite itself because it does feel like we have handcuffs on. And I say that because the league got started under the single entity business plan yes. where everything was owned by the league itself so they could control pretty much every facet of the business. And I understood why it started that way because NASL, it, it was Cosmos only and then everybody else was trying to catch up. Catch and it up. just yeah, it just right. floundered because nobody could keep up. And, and and it was great when it was great. But then when it was got a little bit lean and got struggled a little bit and, and the terrible. Palais and Beckenbauers are ready to move on and maybe the star power, they didn't have any infrastructure underneath or any, any set plans. So learning from their mistakes, which I thought was smart, the single entity plan was born. My issue is that it, I thought at this point we would have evolved from this and allowed the handcuffs to come off and allow clubs to run themselves because – we're in a sustainable part of the history of the league. And that hasn't happened like I thought. And it makes me think that there was never a plan. They just wanted to get this baby off the ground and get the momentum of the 94 yeah, World Cup, which club. even then took yeah, two but, years for them to get yeah, going. But, but the club running itself in what capacity? Being able to choose their secondary jersey, uh, create their own youth division. Um, like, what do you, and, and, I, and again, this is, I'm not being 
disrespectful to no. your answer. I'm asking. No, no, no. I love it. Mean? I want to have conversations. So yeah. So I'm trying to understand what do you mean by the club? So, so well, yeah. I'm saying club autonomy. So, so ultimately, I was part of the executive committee for the first bargaining agreement between the league and the players association. So it was me, Landon Donovan, Ben Olson, Chris Klein, and Pat Onstad. We were the first ones that sat in a room across the table from Don Garber, Mark Abbott, and all those guys and tried to hash out the first ever collective bargaining agreement, which wasn't easy because we didn't have much of a leg to stand on. And ultimately what I tried to express to my team as my player rep for my own team and also to the reps at large around the league, we have to put things in place so that we can stand on those and get it better things down the line. Long like, term. We're not going to get everything here. No. But what can we do now to be smart and proactive about what can help us down the line? So we started to, we got creative. We created this free agency rule. Did it suck at beginning? Of course it did. But we had to like get the language in the CBA so that it could start to be broken apart once the league realized it's not that big of a deal. And that there could be some mechanisms to, to allow more, more, freedom to move from club to club because very restrictive prior to that right and another thing too that i hated and i ended up going to getting uh, i can explain this in a second but the one thing i didn't like was at the time hercules gomez was on my team in kansas city and they wanted to let him go and they shopped him around all the way around the league nobody wanted him so they offered him a quote-unquote bona fide offer and it, nobody knows what the offer was but by the rules they have to just say they offered him something and even if he left, they still retained his rights if he ever came back to MLS, which I think is total bullshit. And I said that in the yeah. New Yorker. And at that time, I was working with Kick TV, which was being housed by MLS. I got called into the principal's office. Like, and they said, listen, if an owner yeah. had said something like that in the New Yorker, we would have fined him 250 k And they threatened to fire me. Yeah. And I said, okay, if you want to do that, then go for it. But I still think that rule is total bullshit. Because... If you don't want the player anymore, why should you have any retention to his rights? It doesn't Correct. make any sense. The NWSL, the women's side, is working through this as well. They're yeah. going through the same type of stuff as they kind of work through their evolution as a league and they work through right. all the rules and they have to relinquish some of the control from a league level. Club autonomy needs to happen so that if Toronto FC wants to pay $13 million a year for Lorenzo Insigne, which is insane uh, because I think you probably could have got him for eight and saved yourself $5 million a year. But, but, they and they do have the right to do that because finally there were some mechanisms put in place, mainly because of David Beckham, the David Beckham rule, to allow these owners to actually spend whatever the hell they want to spend. These guys are competitive guys. They didn't make their money just sitting on it. But They're you don't think guys. that TFC and that ownership group hasn't done some sort of math on how they're going to be making this back? Come on. They didn't if they've decided they to did. give him 12 did. or 13, they've done the math on where they're going to make it back, right? Yes. No, of course. They have 100 percent done that. And and I still think that's a big number uh, for a guy. Yeah, yeah. Listen, and that's we're not talking about the act. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, go on. Of course, anyway. of course, of course. So, 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 as much as I, I want to see Lorenzo Insigne play in MLS, right? That 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 move though was very TFC. Like I don't think MLS had any involvement in that. So, so there have been due to the advent or the evolution of the league, yeah. there have been rules that have been forced. And I always thought during that first collective bargaining agreement that if we're going to get free agency and we're going to get club autonomy, that has to come from the owners. And the owners, I feel like some of them, especially the ones that have gotten in recently, are chipping away at that. But you have the old school NFL guys. Sure. The that hunts, don't want the it crafts. because the whole model is based on exactly. that. Exactly. Exactly yeah. right. So, so there's a lot. And I've heard and I've heard behind yeah. the scenes that yeah. those those owners meetings get contentious because you have the, the young, young blood guys yes, that yes. want to come in. Like, dude, let's take off the handcuffs. And you got the old guys going, but the handcuffs have treated us well and they always fall back on hey we kept this league afloat when it was about to die but they're not you know, listen but they're not back. totally wrong and i'm playing devil's advocate no, here i love I'm, it please do it Keep i'm going. i'm they're not wrong because if it's free willy nilly bullshit it could end up dead again right but at the same time it's 2022 and you're or the new ownership groups with new ideas fresh vibes totally connected to different things in the world. I mean, don't talk to me. Don't, and some 80 year old doesn't know shit about an NFT, <laughs> right? But the new ownership group out of, let's say Texas might know completely what to do in the digital space that changes mm -hmm. their entire business model. And that's where these things are going to come to a head, but it is changing. And in the end, that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. And the, the people are looking at the league totally different. Like I, I, I rem even myself yearly, I, I ingest the MLS differently. 
you know, and I still find myself sometimes having a hard time. I might watch a Champions League game or a major tournament, like a major game in the Prem, in the Premier League. And then I will go to an MLS match and I'm like, what the fuck? And then I'm like, wait, I have to look at it differently. And je- it is different. It is a bit different. I mean, yeah, but you could, the- just to say Sorry. that really quick, I wouldn't yeah. jump in and I mean, I wouldn't watch Brighton Southampton. Like if I watch the Euros or a Champions League game and watch Brighton Southampton, I might have the same exact feeling, you know. So I just think it depends on the context. Yeah, and, and you couldn't pay me to go watch Brighton Southampton, because as much as I like actually like Brighton, maybe that was the best example for them. But no, but no, yeah, it's just like that doesn't necessarily appeal to me either. So it, there's still some context that I think needs to be given because I feel at times MLS gets gets. Uh, it, I, I think for the longest time they pretended that they weren't what they were. And now I think they're starting to accept the fact that, hey, we're a selling league and, and we are where we are. We're, we're, we're growing. We're trying to develop younger players. And finally, that admission by Don Garber, which I think it happened three or four years ago when with the sale of Miguel Miron, where he finally admitted and said it publicly. We're a selling league. We want to be part of the transfer market. That, that I think, really kind of changed the landscape of, of uh, how, the, how the league was viewed. Now, the only way MLS is going to get respect, they have to, get, they have to win CONCACAF Champions League. Yeah. They have to get in the FIFA Club World Cup. That's how you start to chip away at this perception. We already That's have Americans misnomer. now being trusted over by big clubs, which is great. Dest at Barcelona, McKinney, Juve, Pulisic at Chelsea. I mean, these are these are good things. Gio Reyna at Dortmund. It's very, very good that we're making inroads. And that perception of American players is starting to go away. But MLS has still got some work to do. And Lorenzo Insigne, as you said before, uh, an old guy trying to get his money at the end of his career, as much as I think he's going to be great. You know, still, we're not getting them at 27, you know? No, I, I, that's understood. That's understood. You, um, could you see yourself doing any, listen, first of all, thank you for being with me here today. Okay. This is like, oh, dude, we can go I, any honestly, direction. That's what I love. I love the conversation. So I appreciate it. Yeah. And, and, and I'm, I know I, you know, I can't keep you on much longer. And it's also <laughs> because, yeah, but you, it, dude, it's 20. We got to have a part 20. two. We got to have a well, part that's two. What, and so, so I'm leading to that part two. I, I'd like to get you back on and maybe we could, we could jam deeper to the end of this, uh, the premier league season, just before world cup's going to hit off in November. That's going to be gangster. That's going to throw everybody for a loop, but so what? Like it's just gonna be a, it's gonna be an hilarious mess like November next year. I can't I cannot wait. But could you see yourself doing anything else than what you're doing right now? One of my questions to guests is always, what would else would you be doing? I talk to you. I can't, and it's not because I've seen your shit on social media or because I'm enjoying this conversation. I don't like I sometimes feel I know what others could be doing. I look at you and there's zero you could be doing other than in a football ecosystem in my eyes. Now, <laughs> is there anything else? Would you wanted to be an architect, a lawyer, uh, uh, a, a, an aircraft carrier pilot? You know, like, is there anything? Well, I would say that because there was no professional league that I wasn't aspiring to. And I don't know if I ever really answered your question about when I doubled down to be a professional athlete. I guess it's after I got to UCLA and was around guys that were getting drafted. And I thought, oh, I can, I think I can do it. That's where it started to shift for me. But I always just thought I was going to be a teacher and coach high school, you know, oh. and, and uh, I was a math major. Football. And I, uh, yeah, 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 of course. Of course, right. of course. And, and uh, you know, the game is obviously a microcosm of life. It's a great way to teach life lessons and to deal with adversity and all that stuff and, and how to be a part of something bigger than yourself. And I love the community and culture around it. What's interesting is when I was in high school, I, I loved the atmosphere so much that I asked our band to come out and play drums at one of our games just to give Get us like, give here. us that Samba That's beat, awesome. man. Yeah. And they mm. didn't, they didn't come out because they didn't, they didn't know what it meant. They didn't understand what I was asking. We didn't if have a support. Southern team. California at this point. Right. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Skate fo- uh, music, surf, all of that, that punk scene, all of that shit yeah. is deep in eighties, nineties, Southern Cal, man. For That's sure. like For a sure. whole other bag of potatoes, which we'll talk about another time. Um, here's, Jimmy, will you do the 12 questions with me here on Proper Football? I'm going to ask you 12 quick questions, sure, and then you sure. answer however you want. I'll give and you 12, gonna... you want 12 quick, quick answers, or do you want me to be yeah, the Jimmy Conrad? Yeah, 12 quick Conrad? answers. Okay. And before I ask you this, you've got a fucking Spurs jersey behind you. Your Wikipedia page, which you better update, says you're all about Newcastle. You're a Nuki fan. You better do some explaining at some point, or you got to well, update your page. 
No, well, no, I'm a Newcastle fan and uh, it's hard. I'm actually conflicted because usually when oil money comes in, there's a lot of human rights violations <laughs> attached to that. Yeah, yeah. But I guess if you're going to support the World Cup in Qatar, we're all complicit. In this is a lot. That's a conversation I'd love to have it with is, you one day, it by is. the way. Well, you know, our telephones, our tennis shoes, we're probably all complicit. I, 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 go, on, go, on, go on. So, so with regard to this, I had a watch party yesterday for Chelsea Spurs and, and I just <laughs> left it up. So Spurs are going to Spurs, what I said. Because only Spurs would score two goals, not for them, and lose 2-0. Uh, but I got my Newcastle stuff up. I, a lot of What's cool about my backdrop is that I can rotate what's behind me, and I just was a little too lazy to change I, But you know what? I it's a nice thing Spurs, so no, I'm, because, here, I'm here to dig Spurs. Because I want to eventually talk to you about why you're always wearing different kits, because I personally think that's super cool. I'm a little jealous. I have a kit collection as well. But for some reason, I can't put it over my heart because it's over my – it's a long story, but I'm very – when you have your team, you have your team. You can't really wear other teams' sure. colors. It's a very weird, but for a on a fashion well, side, of I'm things, a I'm a plastic yank. Just remember that plastic yank, <laughs> plastic. Okay, I can wear whatever I want. <laughs> Twelve questions for Jimmy Conrad on Conrad on proper football. Here we go. Question one: What is your favorite type of art? Wow, uh, I'd say abstract. What is your favorite song or band? Block party. Favorite footy or sports team? Well, yeah, I'm going to say Lakers because I grew up in the 80s when they were awesome. Yeah, awesome. Lakers. Awesome. Favorite athlete, dead or alive? Oh, favorite athlete, dead or alive? That is, oh my God, that's a tough one to just, I'll say uh, Muhammad Ali was something special. I'll say Muhammad Ali. What's your favorite breakfast item? Cereal. What is your favorite drink, alcoholic and non-alcoholic? I drink a lot of water and I love green tea with honey. And no booze. Okay. You're clean. clean. I like no, it. I try to, yeah, you gain, you try to gain little advantages when you play and, and not hitting the booze was one that is I one of the, to. Yeah, sure. For sure. Yeah. What would be the first thing you bought if you won the lottery? <laughs> uh, I'd buy out of my contract so I wouldn't have to work anymore. No, you know what? Let me say that. If I won the lottery, no, no, I want to take that one back. I, because I would have to work. It's just in my, it's in my blood. It's I want to do blood, something. Dude. I want to create. I want to, I want to give back. I would probably buy uh, a lower league club or an MLS club here nearby and, and try to build them up. I'm in, dude. Uh, dream trip. I, you know what? I'll say I have had the luxury and, and I'm very grateful for the life that I've had and being able to travel all over the world. I've been on my dream trips and uh, that's tough. That is, that is really tough. I guess to, to, I, I've never been to like India, you know, somewhere, I don't know if it's a dream trip, but just a place I've never been before to be able to be exposed to a different culture, I think would be pretty cool. So, you know, um, I've been to Ghana and South Africa. I feel like there's a lot of places in, in Africa. I'd love to go, go visit and see and explore. And there's, there's some, uh, you know what I've learned through my travels, and I'm sure you can speak to it too, that 95% of the people around the world are pretty fucking cool. And it's that 5% that kind of ruin it for the rest of us. So it's always uh, that. I'll, just, I'll, always just, that. I'll, I'll leave it. I'll leave it there. But, uh, you know, anywhere you go to get to meet other people, to, to, to get exposed to a different culture, music and art and, and food, uh, it really changes your perspective on, on life. And it's, it's great. Are you down with NFTs and do you own any? I don't own any. And yes, I'm, I'm wide open. And and open minded to anything out there that's that's pushing the envelope Boundaries. and and uh, trying to make things better and and more diverse. Yeah, more uh, very important question: pajamas or no pajamas, sir? It's cold. It's cold. I wear. <laughs> you know what? I've a guy. I feel like I'm in between. Dude, it's pajamas or no pajamas. <laughs> I know it's a hard one because I sometimes I do and sometimes I don't. So so, so that's I'll say answer. pajamas. I'll, yeah, sometimes okay, that's fine. I'll take it. I'll take it. I'll take it. What is your favorite fashion brand at the moment? I mean, anybody that's supplying kits to my favorite clubs, I suppose. Um, well, that's a really well bullshit answered, answer. Sir. Well answered. Plastic yank. Do you have a superstition? And if so, what is it? I used to. I used to tie my left boot, put on my left sock, left shin guard before I did my right. And wow. no, I don't know, it's just one shit. of those things that made you feel a little bit comfortable, but I don't have anything now. Cool. Uh, and the last one, which is one, there's no right or wrong answer to any of these anyways. 
the proper way to say it. Is it soccer or football? Well, I grew up only knowing soccer, so I, I have to say soccer. But yes, it should be called football. There's no question. And uh, yeah, what I'll add to that, a disclaimer, is that I think it's funny that people want to have an argument about it because we're all talking about the same stuff. I, I, that's why it's my favorite. That's why I love it, bringing it up. It feels like it's a, yeah, what a, it's just like, wow, you're wasting a lot of energy on something that doesn't really matter. But because so, we're talking about a game we both love. And isn't that right. what matters? That we both are connected to yeah, the same but game. That, but, that, and yeah. that's the juice that is this beautiful game. And that's what sure. brings all these little rivalries out. Of course. Uh, Jimmy Conrad. Ronaldo and Messi. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, right. Right. Exactly. Two goats, like, That's right. you know, one. Uh, thank you for being on Proper Football. For all that are following us for the first time, maybe, or just in general, for people to know, we're at PF 137 PM on Twitter, on our Discord. It's Proper Football dash Football, Proper Football on IG, and Football F U T B O L on TikTok. So we're all over the social platforms. Uh, you have said yes to a part two to this because I definitely want to talk to you about a bunch of stuff. So we will take you up on that. Jimmy, it's an honor. Enjoy the transfer window this January. It's I'm hoping for some big juice, not just like little trickles. I hope like we wake up one morning, it's four in the morning, and your Twitter's blown up and melted, and you've just everyone's been like, oh my God. You know, like that's the kind of thing I'm hoping that will happen. I don't think it will, but my heart's hoping. Um, and keep up the great stuff, dude, because it's it's good, man. It's good to see cool people doing cool things that are unique and not just typical if that makes any sense because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it's it's as a sport is a space where it can easily become redundant people can just sort of do the things that we know that work and it's nice to see people trying other stuff mm -hmm. like that's that's what's actually the cool part of the culture right like the zines and the illegal half and half scarfs in the streets that kind of shit turns me on anyways enough plastic yank i love you dude thank you so much for your time and i look forward to catching up again soon all right. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Proper Football. This has been great. Cheers.